Greetings, uh, viewers, ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues in the studio. Welcome to another edition of our Human Resources Development and Management 101 Conversation, the show that honors, respect, and celebrate our leaders in the human resources space. My name is Sam Zima. I am the producer, I am the host at Comesa Global Online Channels. This show is brought to you in partnership with the Institute of People Management, the home of the HR professionals. I'm with my colleagues, as you always know them, but I'm gonna ask them to greet you, welcome our guests, and we are ready for a very, very interesting conversation with two of our most powerful leaders in the human resources field. You will get to know them just now. Over to you, my colleagues. Thank you, Sam. It's such a great pleasure to be going into spring with uh, uh, this great guest. I greet all the viewers, wherever they are in the world. It's such a fantastic time to be celebrating our leaders in the human resources space. Over to you, Bonwe. Uh, thank you so much, Jerry, and uh, thank you so much, Sam. Um, my name is Bunwe Danster. I'm a co-host on this show at the Human Resources Development Management 101. I host this show with my with my colleague George, and today we're actually going to be taking you through a great uh, a great session whereby we'll be talking to our prominent HR leaders, where we're going to be learning from them, where we're going to be taking some tips and see how we actually build our human resources profession. Thank you, George. Welcome all. Thank you very much for joining us. A very important show. And today we have very, very special guests from Bridgestone and Mercedes-Benz and all who aspire to own vehicles will know you must use Bridgestone tires and you must drive Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome this evening. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, anyway, we'll shoot off with our questions. Cool. Thank you so much, uh, George, for that. Uh, listeners, I'm like, okay, what if I don't own a Mercedes-Benz and what if I don't have tires from Bridgestone, right? But anyway, they remain our listeners and we're happy that you've joined us for this session today. So probably uh, starting with, uh, with Julia, thank you so much for joining us. And I think our show really aims at actually sharing the experience, taking people through your career and your trajectory and how you've actually made it this far. And I'd like to start with you to say, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your career and the organization that you're currently working at and how have you landed in the role that you are in today? Great, thank you, uh, Boniwe and the team. My name is Julia Mudise. I am the Chief People Officer for Bridgestone Southern Africa. Um, I always start my introduction by also saying I'm a mother to two very special boys. Um, my career in human resources started uh, 23 years ago. Uh, Believe it or not, uh, I joined the Edgars group um, at the time as a uh, human resources casual. And I always tell the story because there was an HR manager there called Nicole Gierschik, whom I approached and I said, I would really like an opportunity to work in the HR department. I have not commit, completed my qualification, uh, but I'd like the opportunity. She gave me the opportunity. Um, she allowed me to run uh, casual wages uh, for a couple of weeks. And after that, she said, you have potential. Um, the HR officer role is open. You're welcome to apply. I was only 19 years old. Uh, when that opportunity arose, I took it, I learned as much as possible. And of course, I ensured that I continued to study um, and ultimately get my, uh, my qualification. I spent um, about three to four years uh, in Edgars. Uh, after two years, I was prom promoted to uh, the HR manager position uh, to manage a couple of stores in the south of uh, Johannesburg. 
Um, after four years, I decided to transition and I joined the South African Revenue Services. Um, I thought I would have a change of, of industry. Um, regrettably, I didn't enjoy uh, the government. Uh, you can just imagine, right, transitioning from uh, retail uh, to a state-owned entity was quite different. Um, so I then decided to move on and I joined Cummins, uh, Cummins Engine uh, Company. It's uh, a US-owned uh, multinational uh, engine company. And I would probably say after Edcon, that's where I grew the most uh, professionally. I spent a total of nine years um, at Cummins. I started as an HR manager for uh, Southern Africa. Um, and then after two years, I was uh, given an international assignment uh, to go in the to, to go and work in the U.S. as a global um, HR operational excellence manager. Um, an assignment that I did for um, for two years, and I grew phenomenally uh, culturally. Um, I had a taste of um, a different environment, a uh, different continent. I then came back home. Um, I was then promoted to human resources director uh, for Cummins Africa. At the time, the business was expanding um, outside of Southern Africa into the rest of, of, of Africa. It was really on a growth uh, trajectory. I stayed there for about nine years. I then decided to move on. I joined Goodyear. Goodyear Tires. Uh, so Bridgestone is my second tire company. Um, so it probably means there's something I enjoy about uh, carbon black. Um, maybe the smell of rubber. I don't know. Um, I uh, held the role of HR director for uh, Goodyear uh, Southern Africa. Uh, I was in the role for about two and a half years. And then I decided let me change and test myself out of the industrial heavy manufacturing environment. I transitioned to Growth Point, uh, a listed uh, organization, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed my time there. Um, it was a smaller organization, but what was great about it is that it was a listed um, organization, and I had great board uh, exposure in that environment. Um, I then decided to, to diversify my industry experience, and then I went to uh, media and entertainment. I joined MultiChoice um, as a general manager for human resources for South Africa. Very, very different industry. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, after 20 years, I decided to venture out of um, you know corporate human resources i went into executive search and leadership advisory i joined uh, spencer stewart and then i very quickly realized that uh, i need to go back to corporate i missed being in a business uh, driving solutions delivering results um, i really am not a consultant right so I came back um, and I joined uh, Bridgestone, the current CEO of, of Bridgestone, Jacques Fauré, worked with me uh, at Cummins uh, when we were both uh, in our early 20s. Uh, and uh, he gave me a call and uh, you know, I went through the process and that's how I uh, landed up at, uh, at Bridgestone and thoroughly enjoying it. That's great. Um, you know, it's actually quite a great journey and a vast, um, yeah, experience that you have from different organizations, different industries, and I'm sure our listeners can actually wait to hear more, right? Um, to you, Ndade, Ndade Hotle, please also tell us about you, about yourself as a person before an HR professional and your career journey up until where you are right now at Mercedes-Benz. George putting us under pressure for each and every one of us to drive a Merc. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Bonue, and greetings, everyone. I think uh, George is definitely on the money. Uh, there is nothing better than a three-pointed star, so hopefully uh, we will have uh, more and more of you acquiring uh, the car with a three-pointed star. Well, I'm Eddie Hotle. I hail from a uh, dusty township um, of Itzosen, which is uh, located just outside uh, Lichtenberg, and I always talk about the dusty township of uh, it's the same because it grounds me it really 
um, has uh, helped shape me to be the person that I am and also to be the kind of uh, professional that I am. I am a father to four uh, children. Um, and um, I always say that uh, they um, have uh, caused me to lose uh, most of my hair, but I love them uh, dearly, uh, notwithstanding. Um, so yeah, father to four beautiful um, children, I am uh, married, and as uh, you will learn later on, I am an avid biker. Um, this is uh, something I have acquired, or a hobby I have acquired a few years ago, and I'll talk a bit about that uh, in a short while. Uh, my journey in HR started um, um, probably slightly longer than yours, uh, Julia, and uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting uh, journey uh, because I um, studied uh, social sciences and uh, my passion at the time was um, on development of our communities and finding solutions the sustainable development of our communities. And um, uh, I joined the Northwest Provincial Administration soon after graduating. And I uh, you know, served uh, the government for about 18 months. And I was quite chuffed that um, I had the HR manager for one of the denial divisions based in Pochopstrom coming to talk to me um, in my office uh, at uh, the NWPA. And I thought, wow, you know, I've uh, never experienced this. Uh, this must be fun. And uh, he came to offer me an opportunity to join uh, NASCAM, a division of the NL. I enjoyed for close to 10 years and uh, moved from an HR officer and um, promoted uh, to being an HR executive for NASCAM, which was a, a really a very interesting part uh, of uh, my journey. And I remember uh, at the time, my uh, predecessor, Zander Devet, said to me, well, um, you are going to have to learn to swim on your own without me, uh, because I was a bit unsettled about um, the fact that he was moving on and I had not had enough time to um, you know, learn from him. And indeed, I had to learn to swim uh, on my own and uh, a journey that I thoroughly uh, you know, enjoyed and uh, really put me at um, the uh, edge of uh, you know, finding uh, solutions. And uh, I think what was very critical at that point in time is that we had just transitioned into democracy and uh, having to put together the first skills development and employment equity plans at the time and working in uh, Portugstrom, um, which is roughly 40 kilometers outside uh, Fentestop. And for those of us who know our geography and our history, you will know that uh, it was a very, very conservative uh, part of our country at that point in time. So having to work together with employees and with um, unions, specifically the main workers in it, as it was called at the time, um, and helping all of us to understand why it's important to transition and uh, why it's important for us to undertake the transformation journey that we were undertaking at the time, that was quite uh, critical for me. And um, what, what stands out for me is that to this day, uh, because of uh, this long history of working uh, with this uh, particular union, but also then appreciating the fact that uh, the individuals within the union are human beings just like me, um, and uh, that we can have a personal relationship uh, that is not necessarily defined by the different roles that we that we that we play, that became very very critical, and that's why to this day I still have some some of my very good friends um, in uh, Solidarity, which is a successor to uh, Main Workers Ini. 
Um, I then, you know, moved on to join uh, BHP Billiton. I joined the uh, Samanco, uh, their Chrome or their manganese division out in, uh, in the Val as an HR manager and a journey that I also thoroughly enjoyed and brought in just after a major restructure of uh, the business and then having to rebuild the HR function and uh, rebuild the organization as it were post the restructure, which was a, a challenge I thoroughly uh, enjoyed. Like Julia, I made one mistake in my career, and that was to join uh, the city of uh, Johannesburg uh, after BHP Billiton. And I thought, well, it's time for me to contribute uh, towards uh, building a much more professional um, uh, you know, outfit within our city. And we were brought in to help the city establish a, a unit which would have replaced the revenue management uh, unit of the city and uh, was a wholly owned entity of the city. A very, very exciting project that we undertook, uh, but uh, very quickly politics won the day and I quickly realized that uh, that was not the place for me to be. And um, I then moved on to join um, London. Um, Oh, sorry, before London, I went to Graftech, which is a US-based um, graphite manufacturing outfit. Uh, I was out uh, in the Val um, and, um, you know, spent about four and a half years there. And I moved on to London. Um, and London was a very, very interesting uh, case for me. And it remains a very special place in my heart, uh, notwithstanding some of the challenges that we that we had to work through and, and i say that because um, you know there's been quite a lot that uh, we were able to do at london um, i had the privilege of um, coming in as a senior manager hr for their processing division and i led quite a number of uh, uh, important uh, transformation initiatives there. I led a number of uh, restructuring activities uh, within Lonmin, and I moved from HR uh, into corporate affairs, which is uh, another area that I'm very passionate about. And uh, in that space, had the privilege of leading the you know transformation of our uh, corporate social investment uh, portfolio. And uh, what really stands out for me is that uh, when we started with this journey, one of the critical challenges that we faced was uh, every time we had to look for bursary students uh, in local communities, we could hardly uh, find them. And uh, it pained me dearly that uh, we would be able to offer at least on an annual basis over 100 bursaries and that most of those went to kids from outside of uh, the uh, areas within which um, Lonmin operated at the time. And therefore, with this cool transformation program that we put in place, which really touched on all aspects of uh, education, whether it's teachers, whether it's uh, governance, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's preparation of the learners, and so on and so forth. Um, and working through that program, uh, we were able over the years to ensure that um, by the time I left Lonmin, at least, um, uh, you know, 70% or between 70 and 80% of the bezels that we had uh, in our books came from local communities. And, um, you know, it gives me a great sense of pride that we were able to do that, but we were able to do that together with the communities uh, around the operations uh, at Lonmin. Of course, most people talk about uh, August 2012 as uh, the most uh, important or the most critical moment. Yes, it is uh, a critical moment because that uh, week in August is the week that changed our lives. And I call it a week because there is a lot that has happened throughout that week um, that uh, we don't always talk about. And um, it is a week that really changed our lives. It is a week that catapulted us very quickly into a space where we realized that the toolbox that we have as HR practitioners or the toolbox that we have as a business 
wasn't adequate and therefore we needed to you know think on our feet we needed to find alternative ways of um, one resolving the strike in uh, august 2012 and to rebuild the organization post that strike because uh, you know you can't have the same organization after the pain that we that we endured uh, during that week that uh, changed our lives and uh, three that you are then able to reposition the organization um, you know moving forward and um, i had the uh, the privilege of uh, leading the process of negotiating the resolution of um, of the strike and um, it took quite a lot uh, from us it um, um, you know involved uh, many many um, uh, long uh, days it involved uh, personal security risk for some of us uh, but in the end it was really about well this problem has to be resolved you cannot wish it away and the only way in which it can and will be resolved is in us talking to each other. Uh, so, you know, realizing that we cannot uh, afford to continue uh, with the impasse. Uh, and that really led us to finding a solution to the August 2012 uh, strike. And um, what uh, really, you know, stands out for me as well is um, that by the time, um, you know, by 2016, 2017, when I decided that it was time for me to move on, um, we went through a very painful process, yes, uh, but we went through also a very important moment with the union where we looked each other in the eye and we were brutally honest and frank about what really happened and what really led to the impasse and how we may have uh, each contributed to that and how do we avoid uh, ever finding ourselves in that situation again and very pleased that you know that process ended up with a uh, relationship charter that we put in place and um, it uh, pleases me greatly that um, we then went through a number of years of no strike no production stoppages um, and uh, we were able to heal we were able to really uh, bring uh, all the parties uh, together. And um, today, uh, you know, we hardly hear about um, uh, strikes in that part of the world. Yes, uh, Lonmin has moved on, acquired by Sibanye, uh, uh, but, you know, you don't hear some of uh, the gory stories that we had uh, back in uh, 2012. Um, I then moved on to Mercedes-Benz, where I am today, and uh, a great company to, to work for. Um, as I said earlier on, you know, nothing better than uh, the three-pointed star. And it's a journey that uh, I'm enjoying, at least for uh, just over four and a half years now, going on five years. It doesn't feel like five years at all because of the uh, number of exciting things that um, we have been able to do in the last uh, uh, five years. And, and really what's important for me with my role at Mercedes-Benz is uh, just like all the other uh, organizations, you, you learn very quickly that when you sit in the exco or, or in the board, uh, you are sitting there as an equal uh, to your peers. And uh, you are sitting there with a responsibility for people management or for HR, but you are an executive uh, director just like anyone else. And therefore you have the uh, responsibility to work together with your peers um, in building the organization, in resolving the problems that need to be resolved and that uh, together you are able to shape uh, the organization into something much bigger than uh, it is uh, or than it, than it would have been. So Mercedes-Benz South Africa has been an exciting uh, part of the journey for me. Um, you know, we have um, worked very hard on digitalization, on, um, uh, you know, bringing in uh, technology into HR. Uh, we have over the last uh, four Yes, uh, being certified as a top employer the last two years, 
as the top um, uh, OEM um, uh, employer in the country. So we keep pushing ourselves uh, to greater heights. And um, it's a journey that I'm thoroughly enjoying. And we are now at the phase uh, which is quite interesting for the automotive industry, which is uh, you know, a massive transformation of the industry. Uh, and you hear a lot about uh, moving towards uh, electric uh, electrification of uh, the of the vehicles. You hear a lot about some of the mega trends, you know, shared mobility, connectivity, and so on and so forth. So, very very interesting phase of uh, transformation of the industry, and it puts us as HR professionals right at the center of uh, this transformation because we are called upon. Uh, to help the organization bring forward solutions that uh, enable us to position ourselves in this space of transformation and uh, what better opportunity did we have in spite of it being a massive blow to the economy. Uh, but COVID, uh, the silver lining with COVID has been to place us as HR professionals, again, right at the center of uh, managing our businesses as we found different solutions to manage and to navigate uh, the COVID space. Maybe let me pause there uh, for now, Bonnie. Otherwise, uh, if, you do, if I don't, I can talk the whole day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for reining yourself in. <laughs> But thank you so much for sharing your, your journey and listening to the both of you, you know. It actually shows that, you know what, one doesn't get to a certain level of their profession without working hard, without being intentional, and also without, um, you know, without actually having passion for, for what you do. And I think what comes out from the both of you, it's the passion that you have for the people, for the profession, and for the communities that you guys serve in. I think two things that actually caught my greatest attention uh, with your story it's around being given an opportunity under Dinell and um, the person that approached you and gave you the opportunity soon thereafter, the person left, you know. So it's one like, you know, it, and somehow you feel so lost when such happens because I can relate. But the beauty of it, it's, it's also a reminder that one is actually capable, you know. We just need those people who believe in us to give us an opportunity for us to show uh, what we are what we are capable of. And also it's around the Marikana story. It's something that is also close to, to my heart. And I love what you said to say that particular week transformed a lot in our country around labor relations, around employee relations. We've even seen the evolution of the legislation itself because of, uh, of Marikana, as painful as it was, and it remains to be, you know, but it has actually paved um, a good uh, labor relations conversations around, um, around unions and uh, employee relations generally in our country. And thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that. Um, but moving right along, maybe staying still with you, Dr. Hodle, it's like I mentioned earlier that our show is mainly around human resource man, uh, development and management 101, the basics, right? The people that are listening to us right now, it's people that are aspiring to get into the profession. It's people that are very junior. It's people that are in middle management and they actually want to grow, right? So if it's someone um, listening to us at this moment, what, would, what advice would you give them in terms of them having to build a solid... Um, profession or getting into human resources? What advice would you give them? What is it that they need to do? And what is it that you have done, you know, to get yourself where you are? Thanks, Bonnie. Um Yes, uh, indeed, uh, you know, if I just reflect uh, very briefly on uh, the comment you made about the now, uh, yes, was very interesting, uh, but also uh, troubling me because I thought, hmm, you know, this is uh, your first gig, and uh, will you really make it? And um, uh, very quickly helped me realize that um, you have what it takes to succeed. And that's where I would start with, uh, you know, just uh, reflecting on the question that you're raising. All of us have what it takes to succeed. Uh, the difference is uh, in those of us that embrace the opportunities that we get and we run with them and we use them fully because in the end um, it isn't enough for you to have the opportunity the opportunity can be given to you but what is more critical is what do you do with that opportunity 
what value do you uh, derive out of that opportunity? What value do you create out of that opportunity? And how do you leverage that opportunity to hone your skills as a professional? So important for you as you are starting the journey of HR. Firstly, you know, are you passionate about people? Uh, and if you are, uh, you have to realize very quickly that it is not just about the passion. The passion helps you, uh, helps propel you, helps fuel a number of things uh, that uh, that you are able to do. So, you know, have a passion for people because um, without that, I don't think that you will enjoy uh, the HR journey. Uh, Secondly, realize that um, HR is not about you being you know, separated from the business. What I mean by that is that we always look at HR as something that is out, out there and the business is out there. HR is actually an integral part of the business uh, because without people, none of our businesses will be successful. So you are there to enable business success through people management solutions. Uh, and that's why I said earlier on, you have to look at yourself, especially if you are an executive uh, within an organization, you are at the same level as your peers. They are looking to you to bring forward people management solutions. They are looking, for, they are looking to you to help them uh, navigate the very difficult at times space of managing people relations and deriving maximum value out of uh, people. So it's a journey that uh, at times uh, is difficult, especially if I you know, go back to the Lon Min days and uh, some of uh, the, the days um, uh, in the past, it can be a painful journey, but it's a very, very rewarding journey because in the end, you know, if I look back at uh, some of the things that we have been able to do, if I look back and uh, think about the number of young people that uh, we have been able to help uh, through the, whether it's a busy program or whatever intervention that we put in place, if I look back and think about solutions that we have been able to put in place uh, in helping the business to uh, transform, you know, the um, uh, digitalization of a number of uh, HR platforms right here at uh, Mercedes-Benz South Africa, um, and a number of other things that we have been able to do. If I look back at those things, I, I say, well, it's job well done, uh, but it's success that you build on for the next uh, phase of your of your journey, because uh, you can never, uh, you know rest as an HR professional, uh, same as human beings, you are always um, striving for more and more and more. So you use the successes that you, that you gain over the years as building blocks for even greater heights that you are hoping to soar in, uh, in future. So it's enjoyable, you can have fun in it, um, it will bring you a lot of uh, gray hairs if you still have a bit of hair, Certainly, for some of us, we don't. You can look at uh, uh, Dr. Gule, and uh, that's the result of uh, managing people over the years. But it's a very rewarding journey, uh, indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. And back to you, Os Julia. I think on your side, what would you be saying to those aspiring people who are looking into getting into the HR professional and maybe share some of your key lessons that have actually uh, landed you to where you are today? Absolutely. Thank you. Before I answer that, I'm going to just say uh, to my brother here, AB, I also don't have hair, uh, not by choice. Uh, but <laughs> so it happens to females too. <laughs> so um, anyway, I, I think, um, you know, what it takes, uh, particularly as you aspire to get into the people's space, I really don't like to call it HR. Um, it's, it's about being a sponge. Yeah, I use that analogy because you must be willing to absorb 
as much learnings as as possible, right? You need to open yourself up to understand your business. Uh, the business that you will be getting into, you cannot be an effective people business partner without the solid understanding of the business that you're partnering with, the business that you're building people solutions for. So, you know, the concept of being a sponge and of being a lifelong learner, right? So learning never, ever stops, right? Um, even after, you know, two, three decades in the field, um, one is still very open to learn from those that are far more experienced and from those that are less experienced because they come with brilliant out of the box ideas that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily uh, think of, right? Um, I also think talent is not enough, yeah? Talent alone is insufficient uh, to get you anywhere in life. I think uh, it has to be talent uh, that is accompanied by having the right attitude, uh, remember, there's a there's a saying within the people space as well that we hire for for attitude and we train for skills. Yeah, we cannot train a a bad attitude for so for those aspiring, attitude, openness uh, to learning is everything. And you know, as as my grandmother would say, uh, hard work has never ever killed anyone. Right, hard work has never ever killed uh, anyone. So those are the three that I would um, I would put forward as as very very key. In fact, for any professional, uh, you know, even those that are outside uh, the people space, uh, if you you have that armor uh, of being a sponge, having the right attitude, uh, being a lifelong learner. Um, and hard work um, that will certainly uh, prop propel your your career uh, forward. And I I see it with uh, you know a couple of the initiatives that uh, that we have put in place at uh, at at Bridgestone. You know our our graduate program through Yes for Youth um, and the various learnership opportunities that we have at any given point in time. We have about one hundred and sixty. Uh, youths in, in, in our business. They are either going through a trade certification program or they are, you know, in any of the functional areas on, on a graduate program. I always say um, to them, be open uh, to learning and seize opportunities given to you. If there is a project that's being put forth, raise your hand and say, I will run with that project. You may not know half of what you need to do, but just the openness to try and to give it your best shot. Sometimes that's uh, that's effectively all all that you need. Cool. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much, uh, George. My my in my home. Uh, my hairless head is affectionately referred to as a solar panel. <laughs> I think I'm in good company. Right. Uh, Abby, you mentioned uh, something interesting uh, around the role that COVID played in, shall we use the word enhancing? the importance of people in any organization. Perhaps uh, maybe start with you, uh, Juliet, tell us what the lessons you learned from COVID, what has that done for your business and some of the initiatives that you you uh, did for, your, for Bridgestone. And similarly, uh, Abby, if you could address that as well. Thank you, George. Um, so interestingly, I joined Bridgestone in April, um, so just a week after Level 5 lockdown, right? So one, I, I joined the organization remotely myself, 
And one of the first um, you know, solutions I had to come up with is how do we manage uh, COVID, right? So a couple of things that uh, came to the fore was that it's important in an organization to build a strong level of agility, right? Um, that strong level where people are able to adjust um, and embrace whatever circumstances they they found themselves in, right? And and COVID was was one of them, right? So we did a couple of practical things, um, like really bringing our smart working. We call it smart working, or others call it remote working or flexible working. We brought it to the fore. Uh, we ensured that we equip each and every single employee with the necessary tools to be able to work remotely. Um, we then also, you know, leaders didn't know how to lead virtually. Um, so we needed to build the capability to, for leaders to be able to continue to lead their teams, more importantly, to continue to drive engagement. Um, remotely, which is a skill set that, you know, most didn't have, right? So we immediately um, collaborated with an external provider uh, to uh, roll out, you know, leading virtual teams uh, training for, for our leaders. And the actual training itself was also held uh, virtually, right? Um, to to, to help them drive, you know, continue to drive performance, but more importantly, engagement. So we don't lose people while they are working remotely. And thirdly, to demonstrate care. Um, because COVID was one of, it's one of those that um, isolated us. It isolated human beings. Um, we were surrounded by darkness um, in the form of death, in the form of um, ill health. And um, in addition to that, you know, people were also insecure, right? Insecure about their future um, employment, right? How secure was that? Um, that's also, you know, one of the things that was a huge, huge challenge. Uh, we also encouraged our leaders to have, um, you know, check-in sessions uh, with their with their teams and to also hold their Friday fun afternoons, right? So Fridays, everyone, you know, gets onto a Zoom call with their beverage of choice and there's no business being discussed there but it's really just checking in with people. How are you doing? What are you doing for fun? Uh, those were the important things that uh, we did. In addition to that, we also provided our leaders with uh, basic counseling skills because you know grief was everywhere, right? Grief was everywhere. Having to manage teams that have lost colleagues, team members that have lost family, for them to, to understand and be able to say, you know, if an employee is going through this, this is how I best support um, support them through this, uh, this difficult process that uh, they are going with. And then from a hardcore business perspective, we also then had to come up with uh, solutions about how do we keep the business whole? Right, because the business was not operating, right? So how do we come up with, um, you know, solutions to uh, maintain costs um, and, and ensure that we, you know, we keep the business whole, right? For the future sustainability um, of the business, right? And we, we came up with a couple of things, right? Uh, retirement fund contribution, holidays uh you know to uh to make sure that you know employees uh were not contributing at least for those couple of uh of months so that we we kept them whole um and way we had to come up with uh, very benign uh you know compensation uh, sacrifices we were able to also do that but carefully doing it in such a way that employees are also somewhat kept whole as much as we're trying to ensure the sustainability um, of the business. And then, of course, um, you know, one can't talk about COVID without talking about uh, 
health, safety, well-being, mental well-being of, of employees, right? We, in a manufacturing environment, uh, safety is, is, uh, is number one, right? Uh, we don't do anything without having a safety moment. Um, but we had to now take it a step further and say it's not a it's not just about you know observing the uh, COVID nineteen protocols, ensuring the workplace is safe, but how do we ensure that all our team members um, are able to take care of their mental well being? And and you know another key focus was also around destigmatizing mental health. Um, because for those individuals who are susceptible um, to mental health, isolation made it worse, right? Being confined to a space um, made it even more difficult. So I would say those uh, were a couple of key priorities that, uh, that we worked on. <laughs> okay. And before I move to Abby, maybe on a personal level, what lessons did you pick up? COVID pandemic. Yeah. Um, so for me personally, as as a person, right? So not even as a professional, as a person, I realized just how much of a people person I am and how much of a social being I am. Um, so I personally struggled with isolation. Um, and, and I heard you saying you're not so used to people coming to the office, but I'm actually one of those people who still prefers to come to the office, you know, stop and have coffee. Um, so I, it, it was just confirmation for me of how much human um, interaction I need personally as, as, as Julia Mudise. Um, and then I think I also learned um, the importance of spending time with your loved ones, checking in with uh, those that you, you do care about, uh, because I think if anything, you know, COVID has brought to reality uh, the fact that life is short. Um, and what you have today, you, you may not necessarily have uh, tomorrow. So living, you know, your life to the fullest uh, was a key lesson for me. Thank you. Thank you. And Abby, what, what lessons for you? Yeah, and what well, I mean, that's uh, a, Mercedes Benz do for the market? That's a very good point to pick up from uh, Julia. And uh, indeed, I think... Um, if there's one thing that stands out for me is the significance of mental health. Uh, and that became a lot more pronounced, especially uh, during uh, level five and then level four and somewhat into level three lockdown last year. And I say that because like you, my dear sister, the, uh, you know, the recognition or realization that we are social beings uh, became quite uh, clear and quite pronounced. Uh, in my life uh, during those days. And I remember that, uh, you know, there were so many things that we were able to do as a family uh, because we were all at the same place and that helped all of us to make sense of the lockdown, to make sense of this massive challenge that we are all facing and that we don't know when it's going to end, how is it going to end, uh, will it ever end? And how will we be after that? As firstly, as a human being, as an individual, as a family, and also because uh, you know we started hearing stories about this person that has passed on, that one that has passed on, and so on. So the, the significance of mental health and uh, investing as much as we can at a personal level, at a family level to enhance our mental health, to get us into a space where we are able to step out and uh, interact with others outside and bring a lot of value in those interactions. That, for me, was absolutely critical. That's why, you know, one of the things that we, that I, my wife and I ended up doing was to join the so-called uh, 25 Push-Up Challenge. Um, she started first and, uh, you know, 25 push-ups for 25 days. 
and I joined thereafter, and we ended up mastering it, and we ended up continuing with that uh, for a period of time because the message about uh, you know the importance of mental health that that carried was for me absolutely critical. And uh, as I did the challenge, uh, I did it uh, for uh, you know people close to me that I know were struggling with mental health issues at the time. Uh, some of them much closer uh, within my family, uh, and I did it for others uh, in my work or in my you know wider network that I knew uh, struggled with uh, with mental health uh, challenges. So that's the first uh, point I think that's important for me about COVID. If you bring it into the workspace, for us it was a very critical time because uh, we were. Um, uh, uh, right in the middle of uh, ramping down the old sea class. By that, I mean that uh, we were getting ready to start moving into building the new sea class, uh, right? So, which means the old sea class we had to ramp down and also meant that we needed to accelerate the uh, build project for the plant. Uh, as we prepare the plan for the new C class. So being in lockdown, uh, right in the middle of a ramp down and right in the middle of a project uh, which is intended to help build capacity within the plant uh, for the new C class, there was a massive challenge. And it was a massive challenge because it meant that, um, you know, whereas in the past, we would have had to bring in some experts, uh, you know, from our sister plants um, elsewhere in the world to help us with the project phase. Uh, we were not able to do that because of the travel restrictions uh, brought about by COVID. And therefore moving very swiftly into how do we manage the project without um, having the ability to bring people to South Africa became absolutely critical and um, you know leveraging the um, uh, the virtual platform uh, for that became absolutely absolutely critical so ramping down uh, uh, the old seed class getting the plant ready for the new seed class and boom you are now in covid uh, space so how do you manage that uh, uh, that difficult space but it also brought about a lot of anxiety with our people because, um, as you will recall, we had the address by the president. Um, you know, tomorrow you are in lockdown level five and you are not allowed to move around. And that was it. Um, and, uh, you know, we didn't have the luxury of time uh, as we would always prefer. Give us a bit of a warning uh, so that we get our house in order. We had none. Uh, you had to hit the ground running, get your house in order. And uh, the analogy that I used at the time was uh, this car had to start moving, even if it was incomplete. So whether it meant that uh, I ran on um, some bad tires until Julia provided me with tires, or whether it meant that uh, I had to run with uh, a number of uh, you know parts of the vehicle not being there, the vehicle had to run, and we were able to do that. And for me, that uh, just demonstrated how resilient we are as a people, uh, yeah. Yeah. and how uh, agile we can be when called to to be agile. So we're very resilient, we're very agile, and move very quickly into that space. So. Some of the things that we did are uh, exactly the same as uh, what Bridgestone would have done. Firstly, my biggest uh, concern was uh, how do we pay our people? Uh, because, uh, you know, for me, it was, I was very clear about one thing, that um, we cannot put the added pressure on our people about how they are going to be paid or about our people not going uh, home without any pay. So securing tools to ensure that our people were paid um, during that difficult period was absolutely critical. And that was one of uh, the major priorities that I, that I had to work through uh, with the business. Secondly, um, managing the health and safety of our people during this difficult period 
which meant that um, we needed to lead it, we needed to be a lot closer uh, to people, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we are not able to physically uh, meet, we are not able to physically hug and uh, you know uh, talk to each other. Um, we needed to ensure that we have very robust uh, health and safety systems in place. Uh, very quickly assembled the crisis management team, very quickly put uh, the communication uh, system in place where we kept in touch with our people, uh, especially throughout the first um, uh, two or three um, hard lockdown uh, periods. But then also to balance that with the need for a sustainable business beyond COVID-19. Because, um, uh, you know, you cannot uh, insist on paying people uh, because that money has to come from somewhere. And you cannot insist on paying without having a conversation at about the same time about how do we ensure sustainable business beyond COVID-19, which was why some of uh, the uh, you know, uh, most important steps that we took, such as um, uh, compensation uh, sacrifices, uh, that we needed to take as leaders uh, for a period of time were absolutely critical. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, sacrifices that some of our people had to uh, take um, over a period of time were absolutely critical. And that's why it was also important to make sure that we bring in all the support, all the wisdom that our people have uh, to ensure that we are able to build a business that will be able to sustain itself beyond uh, COVID-19. So th those would be some of the key things that I say were critical. You know, you want a sustainable business, uh, but uh, that sustainable business is not just possible without your people. And therefore, in ensuring the health and safety of people, investing in the communication programs that we put out, investing in the support systems that we put in place for our people, whether it was uh, through, uh, you know, the employee assistance uh, program or whatever uh, mechanisms that we put in place, ensuring that those systems are in place and they are working and they are supporting our people and they are supporting them together with their families, that became absolutely critical because in the end, if you as a husband uh, test positive and your wife works with us, she is impacted. And if uh, the husband passes on, she is impacted. And therefore, ensuring that that support was there uh, became absolutely critical. Lastly, what we also got to realize was um, much as we are doing a number of these things with our people and for our people, they live within communities. Uh, and uh, those communities were equally uh, battling with uh, the pressures of uh, COVID-19, which really led us to put a number of uh, community uh, interventions in place as well. For example, we had our paint shop um, uh, produce sanitizers. How fantastic, you know, to have our people within our plant deciding, well, you know, we have this and that uh, tool that we could use to develop or to uh, produce sanitizers and to then produce those sanitizers um, and have those sanitizers uh, being shared with the uh, kids in our schools as schools were opening up uh, after they had lockdown. That was one of the most important uh, steps to do face shields that we produce through our uh, 3D uh, you know, tools uh, in our plant, that became absolutely critical. Um, the opportunity that we had in availing some of our vehicles, and I, if I recall correctly, we availed some of our X-class units at the time to do community mobi mobiliz mobilization uh, on COVID-19, that became uh, absolutely critical. And then partnering with Gift of the Givers um, at the time, uh, specifically for those families that were, you know, badly impacted by the lockdown um, and enabling them to put food on the table, um, that 
became uh, so, so critical. So there's quite a number of things that, um, that we did uh, together with our partners uh, in the community space, which really built on the strong uh, story that we are building about ensuring proper support for our people uh, through the COVID uh, period um, and ensuring that as we do that, we don't lose sight of um, building a sustainable business beyond COVID. Truly impressive, truly impressive. I was actually going to ask you about the, uh, your corporate affairs ahead, so, but you, you, you've gone ahead of us there. But any lessons around that in terms of uh, your relationship with your communities? Uh, coming out of uh, COVID? We cannot be successful as an organization if um, we are inward focused um, only without thinking about the communities around which we operate and we, which is really, you know, part of the exciting, uh, uh, you know, package of uh, my role because uh, my role doesn't only look at people uh, within the organization, it also looks at how do we build a strong relationships with um, our partners in the community. Uh, and uh, this involves uh, building a very strong relationship, for example, with the local municipality, uh, with government organization, with uh, non-government organizations, and so on and so forth. And uh, I think, if anything, COVID has really, uh, put to light, once again, the importance of sustainable relations between business and communities. Because uh, in the end, as I've said uh, in, in past occasions, in the end, you are as successful as a business as the success that you are seeing in our community. And if you think about the fact that uh, South Africa sits with a massive challenge of unemployment, I think the latest numbers are 34% uh, unemployment or just over 44% with the extended definition. Um, this is a ticking time bomb. And if we don't address it, um, it will come to destroy whatever uh, it is that we are trying to build outside of um, ensuring that we've got sustainable communities um, around us and as we do that, you know, if you have Mercedes-Benz doing that, you have Bridgestone uh, with their fantastic program doing that, you have the next company doing that, very quickly, the cumulative impact of that intervention helps us in ensuring that we are able to create sustainable communities around the operations. And uh, with those sustainable communities, we are then able to launch uh, whatever these uh, massive uh, programs that uh, the different businesses may have uh, to advance themselves and to ensure that uh, they remain successful. So you do need solid relationships with your communities. You need solid relationships with your stakeholders and you need to work together with them to find solutions. So you cannot, as a business, bring down solutions, right? You have to work together with the stakeholders to find solutions. Of course, we bring with us uh, some of the knowledge, some of the expertise that we have, uh, but we also realize that we don't know it all. Uh, we need our partners in the community, in civil society, uh, to work together with us in finding solutions and working together in implementing uh, these uh, solutions. Dr. Gule, I see you have brought us uh buckets of wisdom with these two people <laughs> <laughs> thanks what, george what, thanks what can you say about that yeah i mean we have fantastic leaders here and and um, you know we're so grateful to have them and and we have them for a season that this is what they are reminding us of live to the fullest and i hope that our hr practitioners listening there it's one of the things that we pick that in whatever job we find ourselves doing we really need to do it uh, with passion and with commitment. I have I have a couple of questions for, for our leaders today. Julia, I have the simplest question, but met an interesting question in terms, you have been in many places and both of you have worked. I mean, I know, AB, you, you also go to Germany from time to time. That's where your SQEs as Mercedes-Benz. 
But Julia, when when you travel all these places, places that you have been, can you just identify for us three places and the cuisines that you enjoyed there? I'm asking this question to the both of you. All right, so that's a that's a fun question. Um, so I mean, I, I I will start with with the US, right? Because uh, I got to spend about two and a half years there, and. Um, I must say nothing beats uh, an American steak uh, from Indianapolis. Um, so I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, and then in my time uh, traveling within Europe as well, I would say what I used to enjoy the most uh, is uh, all the divine pastries uh, from uh, France in, in particular. Um, and then I spent a little bit of time in uh, in Dubai. And uh, in Dubai, I must say, it was not necessarily cuisine, but it was fashion. Um, fashion and, and just uh, just the good life uh, that I, I really grew to uh, to appreciate uh, in my in my time there. Um, and I think also just walking away with an appreciation of the different cultures, right? Um, just how people live and, and you know, the nuances that um, you can't find when you are Google searching, but you really just, uh, just experience them. So, you know, I guess another nugget um, is that when you do travel and, you know, most of us only started really traveling properly for business. Um, when you do, make sure you, you know, you set time aside for some sightseeing, some cultural experiences. Um, and for me, of course, a bit of shopping uh, doesn't hurt. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you. <laughs> oh, Julia, retail therapy. <laughs> Well, um, a number of places that I've been that um, are quite interesting to me. Uh, of course, Germany, uh, that's where I travel most of the time in my current role. Uh, nothing that beats the spatula, um, you know, the German spatula. Um, and um, don't say this aloud. Uh, I am not a beer fanatic, but there's just something about German beer. Um, that uh, will make you want to have it uh, each time that uh, that you're there. So those would probably be the two that stand out. Of course, I mean the the I also love the bread. Um, uh, the, the, their bread is uh, different. I've not seen uh, that bread uh, anywhere else. So yeah, uh, a few dishes, uh, German dishes that I really really love. Um, and of course, uh, German beer uh, is uh, something that I truly enjoy. I also enjoy traveling, uh, you know, being in China. And uh, for me, China is more than just about cuisine, but it's about exposure to what is possible. Um, if you are working very, very hard to building a solid uh, story, a solid case, uh, for a successful country. Yes, you know, some of us look at China and say, well, you know, uh, it isn't a democracy and all those uh, things that we say about it, but guess what? Um, if you've had the privilege of uh, being in China uh, several times as I have been and seeing how that country has developed massively over the last 10, 15 years, for me, it just shows what the scope is uh, if we got our act together as South Africa. And if we as South Africa focused collectively on building a very, very strong uh, country. So that's what I probably draw uh, from China. And, um, and it is uh, for me a, a very, heartwarming story because if I look at our plant in China, which is one of the biggest uh, in the world, uh, and the fact that it is run by a South African, um, and a South African who ran the Mercedes-Benz plant in East London, and he's doing a fantastic job in China, uh, you then see 
that it is possible uh, for us as South Africans to also succeed in the in the global space. Uh, and then, of course, I uh, have been to a few other places, and um, yeah, uh, Dubai probably stands out also uh, for uh, the retail therapy that um, that you spoke about, uh, Julia. But but in the main, you know, for me, I also look out for cuisine, and um, as I said, you know, uh, uh, what stands out for me is the specialer. Uh, in uh, Germany, and uh, that I enjoy every time I'm there. You know, I, I have th this early on in your in your discussion in your talks. Both of you mentioned the fact that certain people you are at the early part of our transformation as a country. Can you talk about that period? Um, because we are back into diversity, equity, and inclusion. What 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 happened? I thought we were on track, we we're coming all right. So we have now this problem of uh, uh, once again, uh, not real experiencing that, uh, that, that well, uh, managing this transformation well. What can you say, I'll start with you, Julia. What are you experiencing as a, as a, as a, as a professional in the people management space uh, around this issue of diversity and inclusion and equity right now? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Gule, maybe, you know, for me, starting right at the beginning, uh, as I said, the, the lady who saw potential in me when I didn't know that I had any potential uh, was Nicole Gieschek, um, a, uh, a white lady at the time. Um, and the one thing that um, she, she taught me very, very early on um, in my career as a, a people uh, professional is to focus on building diverse teams. Um, and when I look at where I am today and where I have come through, I think um, it always starts with leadership commitment, right? And it starts with... Uh, building a very strong business case uh, for, for diversity, inclusion, as well as belonging. Um, and I've just started this journey with, uh, with Bridgestone where we've just finalized, uh, we call it our DIB, uh, our DIB strategy and plan, which uh, effectively talks to our business case for, 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 for diversity, right? So, um, you know, that diversity is, is, is our strength as, as uh, a business. Inclusion is our commitment, right? So it's as much as it's important to bring the diverse individuals into the organization, there has to be commitment. Uh, to ensure that those individuals are included and there is no revolving door. Um, the third piece is, is around belonging, where we say that we embrace each and every um, individual, regardless of, of who they are, what they look like. And I use an analogy, right, that diversity is inviting someone to the party. Um, inclusion is asking the person um, to choose music, right? So they are included and their favorite music is also included. And belonging is having that same person dancing as, as though nobody's watching, right? Um, and, and I use that analogy every time um, to try and explain this complex uh, diversity, inclusion and belonging. Um, and I think we, we also need to move away, uh, Dr. Gule, from uh, compliance. Uh, so, you know, you know, employment equity is phenomenal. Um, we, we need to comply as a business. I think that goes without saying. Um, but we, we, we need to, you know, build diverse organizations because it is simply the right thing to do. And it helps us drive innovation. Um, and it helps us solve very complex business uh, challenges that you would otherwise not be able to solve if you only have 10 males uh, in the room, right? 
um, you know, since I joined, the CEO and I have built a very diverse leadership team. So 50% of our uh, executive team members are, are black um, and females. Yeah. So uh, we have a very, very diverse team. Our CFO is uh, a black Indian. Um, our head of uh, legal compliance uh, and risk, uh, black female. Our sales uh, consumer director is a black female. Myself, I'm a black female. Our operations uh, director is a, uh, a a black male, right? So we, we've not only come up with the strategy with these great words, um, but we've also demonstrated it, right? Um, and for an entire organization, 30% our leadership, uh, so when you go down below EXCO, 30% of our leadership cohort is females. Um, and, you know, I'm also very, very proud uh, to say that uh, four of us in the, in the organization um, were in the gender mainstreaming uh, awards. Um, and my colleague Tandeka has won the uh, regional positive role model uh, gender mainstreaming award for multinationals and our CEO is actually in the finalists um, of the gender mainstreaming awards so it uh, it is so important and as as with anything if you don't measure it nobody cares about it right so it, it has to be visible it has to be measurable um, but it does not happen without leadership uh, commitment. And I'm very proud to be part of Bridgestone. We're the only tire manufacturer um, that has a level three uh, triple BEE rating, right? Um, you know, if you look at our ownership score, our ownership score alone, uh, we scored 24 uh 24.9 points out of a possible 20 20 uh, 25 uh all right so we don't only pay lip service to this uh we we very very committed and we measure it we ensure that uh people um is also very much a part of each leader's uh scorecard um and we measure it right um and we also make sure to show and tell Thank you. Uh, thanks, Julia. Uh, uh, AB, what, what is your experience with uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, firstly, I think that um, I always move off the base uh, within the Mercedes space. Uh, move off the base that says, we are operating <clears throat> virtually in all regions of the world as a brand. Um, so, you know, we build cars in China, we build cars in the US, we build cars in Germany, we build cars in Hungary, we build cars here in South Africa. So, you know, if you move off that base that we already have a diverse uh, sort of platform, uh, we are already um, realizing the importance of having a diverse uh, production platform, a diverse business um, that runs across all regions of the world. Um, it, 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 it makes it part of the DNA to be a diverse organization. Of course, within a South African space, what worries me a lot at times is that we are ticking the box and we are, primarily looking at how do I get to level two, level one, or whatever it is. And that's why, you know, at times I am a bit controversial about um, these uh, triple B, double E levels. They mean nothing uh, to me unless they are backed up by deliberate intentional efforts by businesses to embrace diversity and inclusion, to realize that uh, the business case for DNI uh, is quite strong. You will never be able to succeed if you have one uh, group of people only um, in the organization. And therefore, uh, that's something that we need to uh, really uh, look at. So 
move away from the compliance and the tick box exercise mode into a meaningful conversation about diversity and inclusion. And then, of course, move away from that meaningful conversation into practical things that you are doing as an organization to implement um, uh, DNI, whether it is uh, through, as it is in our case, uh, you know, through our pipelines, uh, targeting 60% female uh, with our pipelines, uh, which enables us to ensure that we are able to build stronger talent pipelines uh, than we would have uh, built uh, in the past. And uh, this uh, means, you know, whether we're taking people for um, internships, whether we're taking people for learnerships, whether we're taking people for graduate development programs, whether we're taking people for bursary development program, whatever uh, talent pipeline development uh, measures that we're putting in place, targeting at least about 60% uh, female uh, for those um, uh, for those uh, for those initiatives is absolutely critical. But also meaningful steps that we are taking to change the way we are structured today and ensure that we continually increase the level of uh, female representation in the, in, you know, um, as, a, as, a, as one of the key elements, uh, but also ensure that we have diverse, uh, diversity in so far as uh, race is concerned. Uh, that is uh, absolutely critical. The one element that we have not done a lot on or as a nation and that I feel we are still lacking on is in how we are addressing the LGBTIQ uh, matters. Uh, we talk about them, but are we actively putting steps in place to ensure that we remove the stigma um, that, uh, or the labels uh, that the LGBTQI community always carries uh, when they move around? So, you know, when you see me participating, for example, in the pride movement, uh, which we do and which I do proudly uh, every year, it's not because, you know, I'm doing it because it gives us good PR or anything, but it is in us wanting to demonstrate as leaders that this is something that we hold dearly, this is something that we feel very strongly about, and this is something that we really need to ensure that we begin to embrace uh, in our community. The last point um, on diversity and inclusion, and uh, this is a point that I'm very passionate about. I am a father to three beautiful girls. And the extent of gender-based violence that we are seeing in our society is a real concern. And it is uh, something that will, you know, uh, take us away from addressing some of the bigger uh, ticket items such as uh, DNI and ensuring that we embrace it. Uh, we have to take meaningful steps to address this. And I, you know, publish a bi-weekly uh, letter to, to my team and there is not one of those that uh, miss uh, at least a comment from me about how I, you know, detest um, uh, gender-based violence. And uh, for me, I'm looking at it at a personal level. If, uh, you know, you are perpetrating gender-based violence, it could be my daughter, one of my three daughters, it could be my wife, it could be my two sisters, it could be my aunt, it could be my mother, it could be my colleague, Julia, that you are unleashing this violence to. And it has to stop. And it takes us as leaders, especially us as men, it takes us standing up boldly and making sure that we bring an end to gender-based violence. AB, I wouldn't say it better than you have said it, my brother. It's uh, it's such, I mean, the points that both of you are raising around 
um, diversity and inclusion and belonging, Julia, you said. I mean, in the space where we work away, you were working mostly from home. And we know at the beginning of, of, of the lockdowns what happened and uh, uh, the gender based violence thing just went up, which tells us that what you tell the story about our society. Anyway, so you guys are more than just HR people, right? The stuff that you're talking about, um, it, it, it goes beyond just being an HR professional, which is great. But I'm going to hand over back now to Boniwe. And uh, but before I do that, let me just ask this question. I mean, I don't drive a, a, a three star thing, but I do drive something that is fast. And uh, Abby, you drive something that is even faster than a three star thing. Why is that? Why are you a biker? What's happening? <laughs> I, you know, what, what do you enjoy from that hobby? And I'll come to you, Julia. What's your hobby? So, but let me start with with Abby. What's all about the bike? <laughs> Well, nothing beats, uh, you know, me being on my motorbike and uh, just being in a space where it's me, the motorbike, and the wind. Um, and, of course, the road, because uh, that centers me a lot. Because, uh, you know, when you are a biker, you realize that the margin of error is that small and therefore you need to be in the moment you need to be in that space at that time when you are on a bike and that is what i get the thrill from because i forget about everything else and i'm in that moment of being on my bike uh, traversing the beautiful roads of uh, South Africa, and uh, being able to just recenter myself and uh, get back home after a ride, being so fulfilled that I am ready to face anything uh, that you can throw my way. And what is even more beautiful about it is that I do this with my wife. Um, both of us are bikers, both of us are avid bikers, and uh, it is something that uh, we have acquired, or the, the hobby that we have acquired over the last number of years. And I, when I started talking about um, wanting to acquire a bike after, uh, you know, Marikana, because a friend of mine said, hey, man, I'm doing this thing, try it, uh, maybe it will help you. I uh, got home and always the challenge is, uh, are you able to convince your partner about uh, that? And I got home and I said to my wife, hey, you know, uh, my friend and I were talking about this thing and I want to do it. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, it's fine, you can do that. The only condition is that you get me a bike as well. And that was it. So <laughs> we do it together and we thoroughly enjoy it together. And, um, you know, one of the most memorable trips that we did is a 5,500 round trip, uh, kilometer round trip uh, between from East London to Sokok Moon in Namibia and back. Uh, and we did that uh, just the two of us on our bikes. It took us three days to get there. We took us three days there. It took us three days to get back. And, um, you know, it really is something that I find uh, quite uh, fulfilling. And it helps, as I said, you know, take me out of whatever other challenges that I'm facing, just focuses me in that moment on my bike. And uh, that is heaven uh, to me, uh, Brajeri. Thank you. Thank you. Julia, what, 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 I haven't met you on a bike on the road, but what, what's your hope? <laughs> I am trying to convince so, her. I am trying to convince her. She and I had a conversation recently about it. Uh, it won't be long, Brajeri, that she will be on the bike as well. <laughs> no, that's true. That's absolutely true, uh, Dr. Gule. So uh, I'm not a biker yet, but uh, AB is working very hard to get me to be a biker. Together with all my colleagues uh, that I work with, I think they're all bikers. And... Uh, you know, uh, we were invited to a breakfast just uh, three weeks ago. Uh, the CEO hosted all of us and uh, they all showed up in their bikes and uh, 
the only thing that I could bring was, uh, you know, my sports car um, because there was no other way of, of fitting in. So, yeah, I am in the market. Um, but as for hobbies, um, so I really enjoy running. Um, you know, pre-COVID, I used to participate in the uh, 21K runs. I used to travel around the country. Uh, for runs, but uh, with COVID, of course, that has come to a bit of a halt um, in health as well. Uh, I think the joints are starting to complain. Um, so I do need to find uh, something else. Um, but what I also enjoy is, is to serve. Um, so I am an entertainer of note. Uh, I, I enjoy cooking. I enjoy hosting. Um, so I, I always am surrounded by uh, family and friends, um, and uh, I don't mind spending a lot of time in uh, in the kitchen, uh, cooking and, uh, and 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 hosting. Just being surrounded by uh, good food um, and laughter. What do you want anyway? Um, thank you so much, Jerry. And I think you've actually, you know, taken us a detour to the left, you know. It's so interesting to be hearing all these things like on a personal level rather than focusing on the on the profession itself. But I actually want to say to the two leaders, it is actually quite uh, inspirational to hear about your journeys. And I think around your authenticity, especially when we're talking about the transformation agenda in terms of what it means to you, uh, you know, personally, and the contributions that you have made in your different uh, organizations. And I always say one thing about transformation, um, and to Julia's point as well, it's not about the stats, it's not about legislation, right? It's intrinsic as a leader, you need to want it personally, without having to balance any states. And I think the more people get that, the more the, the transformation agenda will be quite easy for our, for us in our in our country, in our respective organization. And the work that you guys have have done, you know, it's actually quite commendable. And Julia, just to read about um around Bridgestone, you know, moving over to level three in such a short space from level seven to four to three, you know, uh we're waiting with bated breath for that level one. <laughs> You know, um, but as we are actually uh, getting to the close of our show, I just want to get a few points from you. You know, what do you think, Julia, would what is the future of human resources or people in the in the people management profession? And secondly, what what is your expectations or what do you want to see uh, institutions like IPM do uh, in the future and also in developing the right and providing the right support in terms of people management? What is it that you want to see us doing in IPM? How do we want, how do you want us to see contributing into, into the profession? And I think that would be a good uh, closure for us so that we know that, you know, we put in the right things in place to make sure that our profession remains on top of others. Thank you, Bonnie. So I think the one profession that will survive all professions is the people profession. Um, because although we have AI, we have, um, you know, robotics, et cetera, um, the human touch and the human interaction will always be there, right? So I see a future for, for the people function, you know, beyond, um, you know, the next, uh, you know, 100 years, uh, because I think human beings are unique um, and will always uh, require people um, solutions uh, within a business environment and also uh, within the communities um, in, in which we live. We cannot replace, fully replace uh, human beings. Um, and as for professional development, I think I would like to see more emphasis um, on professionalizing um, our, our profession, right? Um, I think there's been debates around this. I think in as much as, you know, chartered accountants go through some form of, uh, you know, certification process, um, and, you know, there's a professional body, they're held, held to strong ethics, I think uh, ultimately we need that uh, for, for the people uh, fraternity. I also believe that we need to focus a lot more on 
core business skills. Core business skills, because I really, really do believe that the days are gone of just understanding, you know, the social uh, sciences um, and not necessarily being able to relate to numbers, uh, not being able to get the commercial aspects of, of a business. We need well-rounded people partners. Um, and, you know, the core business skills are so, so imperative. Um, and I think leadership, because to be quite honest, in this profession, uh, whether you have a team or you don't, you are a leader. You are continuously coaching your executive team. You are continuously coaching, you know, managers in the organization. So the focus on building that critical core leadership capability from a very young age, um, I think, is is important. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. And I'm sure Dr. Goulet took notes and he's going to start working on that, <laughs> building a business case in, in terms of professionalizing our profession. Um, on your side, what would you want to see IPM do and contribute into, uh, into our profession? And what do you think the future of uh, human resources holds for us? Well, we are in a a very interesting phase of transformation of uh, humanity, as we said earlier. And um, we will see an increase in the use of robotics, um, increase in the use of uh, artificial intelligence, increase uh, acceleration, uh, quite frankly, in 4IR and so on and so forth. But what remains clear in my mind and what remains clear, I think, for all of us is that humans will remain uh, to be quite critical and people will remain quite critical in our businesses. And therefore you will always, and you will have an increased interface between people and technology, uh, you know, through artificial intelligence and so on and so forth. And even for us as HRS people management professionals, it means that we need to learn to embrace technology a lot more. We need to embrace the value that we can get out of technology a lot more, which means that we need to look at the employee journey uh, in our respective organizations, identify those important touch points, and there are definitely touch points that are well served by technology. Uh, and even in that regard, you will always have people and you will always have a need for somebody with a soul uh, who is able to look you in the eye and say, Bonnie, way, um, it is okay. And you matter to the business. And uh, this is the contribution that you are making to the business. So I am not at all unsettled by the 4IR advancement. I'm not at all un unsettled by artificial intelligence. I actually embrace it. And, you know, some of you might have heard me in different platforms saying, if I go to our body shop, which is the first step of our production, we run that with approximately 500 robots. So it's here already. But, you know, you have an interface with people. So uh, the, the, the request really for, for, for IPM is uh, a fantastic job that you are doing, uh, Dr. Gule, in uh, leading this uh, very, very important uh, part of... Uh, professionalizing our space and ensuring that this remains a critical uh, space that needs to be given a lot of attention. And of course, it's so crucial that in developing well-rounded uh, people management professionals, uh, as Julia said, we are also enabling us as people management professionals to fully understand the businesses that we serve. I can tell you without any doubt that the one success factor for me in the uh, 27 or 20, yeah, to about 27 years <laughs> that I've had in this space has always been a very keen interest in understanding the business, a very keen interest 
in knowing all the intricacies of the business because I have seen and I know that people's solutions mean nothing if they are not answering the key challenges that the business is raising. And you can only be able to be in that space if you understand your business, if you take your place at the table. Um, and I would really encourage you, uh, you know, maybe that's a parting short, take your place. Nobody is going to dislodge you from that. Take it. And as you take it, use it to the full. And of course, with the help of uh, institutes such as IPM, we will help build well-rounded people management professionals. Thank you so much, uh, in the day, Jote, and thank you so much, Julia. What a great pleasure and what a great conversation that we're having. Mr. Dima, if you can just be uh, lead us into closure, sir. Wow. You are business leaders charged with the responsibility to lead the people agenda of the business. The lessons that you have shared with us are quite so profound. I, I listened attentively as you were sharing with us your journey. There are quite clear takeaways for me and I'm sure for our viewers. You have moved from sector to sector. It might have been because of what you found out not to be what you were looking for. But in reality, you have taken the lessons with yourself as you move on from one sector to sector. I think that for me is a valuable insight that you've shared with us, that there is value in getting to know the diversity of sectors, and, and, and ultimately finding the place that you will call home and bring those lessons with you. That is very, very fundamental. It's almost like you were on a journey of developing yourselves as leaders. Uh, and and, and you, you, you have indicated, uh, Julia, that you, and even yourself, and that the whole, that it is fundamental that you understand the business you are in. People management without actually uh, being informed by the business you are in is of no value. So, so I, I believe that it should be possible to get CEOs coming out of people management. And I'm sure that should not be impossible. And I think in many cases it does happen. Um, we, we are in the era where leadership is being asked to step up. We are in a leadership crisis. But when I listen to people like yourselves, I believe that we shouldn't be having that crisis. Perhaps we haven't really looked deeper into ourselves and say, what must we do as people to really craft the leadership capabilities within ourselves? And that goes beyond just knowing the business and knowing the processes, understanding the strategies. It goes to working on ourselves, our conscious self-leadership aspect, a values-based leadership, not looking at diversity, management, inclusion, and belonging as a nice to have, but as a core to business. And I would like to conclude by saying that what I see in yourselves is people that have actually worked with local South African companies, people that have worked with multinationals, people that have worked with the parastaters or state-owned enterprises, that have worked with the private enterprise and industries, and you have become way who you are because of all those. I think what, what, what you, are, you are saying to us is that this is a journey that never stops. And that is really, for me, how I will sum up the lessons that we are, we are getting from you. And this is really the whole idea about this show. This show is about, number one, to celebrate you, because you have been there. You have seen it. 
and you have delivered and you are still delivering. You're still passionate, you're still purposeful and you're still deliver, be, performing. Secondly, this show is to position HR as not just one of those professions that you can just go into because it's easy to go into, but it's really critical and core to where we want to see, take our country to. And we want people to intentionally say, I want to become an HR practitioner and becomes a leader in people areas to support the business. This show is also to challenge the thinking out there that HR doesn't matter, that HR can be done away with when we are actually not having enough resources to support employment of people. But I also want to say that it confirms and through crises like COVID, that if we did not have people like yourselves, many organizations and even countries will have collapsed. If there's still doubt there about the role that, 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 that HR plays in business, in the society, that that needs to be changed. So having said that, I would like to thank you very much for, for really making yourselves vulnerable. We have asked you a lot of very, very personal, personal questions when it comes to what you have done and what you haven't done. And through you, I believe that we have really educated many people out there, including ourselves. In conclusion, I would like you just, each one of you, including my colleagues, just to reflect a little bit. But for you personally, what has this show uh, revealed to you? What has it confirmed to you and what are you taking home and what will you do better as a result of these conversations going forward? And I will start with, uh, let's start with you, Ndate Khotli, and then Julia, and then of course my colleagues. Thanks, Ndate um, Zima. And uh, once again, thank you very much. It uh, really is a privilege for us to have this uh, opportunity to be on this platform, on this show, to share our experiences and uh, to really open up about the journey that we have traveled. It is, um, uh, it is uh, really uh, comforting to know that um, I'm not alone. And uh, I know my dear sister Julia and I always, uh, uh, you know, we either talk on WhatsApp or we would call each other when there is uh, one or two or one or other business topic that we may need to have uh, guidance on. And uh, clearly we, we're not alone. And this is a journey that is uh, well traveled by all of us, uh, putting our hands together and uh, putting our shoulders behind the wheel as it were, and uh, moving our country forward. It is possible. And I hope that the you know, experiences that we share with you uh, inspire you. And I hope that these experiences help shape your own journey as a people management or HR professional. And hopefully next time we listen to you, we listen to your story, um, which uh, would uh, be much better, much stronger than our stories. And uh, we remain available, really, to share our experiences, uh, work together with uh, you, and um, ensure that in the end, we continue to put our people first. And we continue to put people at the center of the success of our organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Julia. Thank you, uh, Sam. Um, I think today my key takeaway is, you know, the, the wisdom that exists um, just in this room of, of six people is, is amazing. And if, if we were able to reach out more, we would all be amazed at how much talent, how much wisdom, insights exists out there. Um, and we certainly need more platforms of this nature 
to be able to just share, um, to just share. And in that sharing, there's a lot of learning. Um, and I'm very passionate about learning. There's a lot of learning um, that happens. So we certainly need to do more and more of this. And thank you, uh, Cometa, in collaboration with IPM for, for the opportunity. And to our aspiring um, people professionals, um, we're here for you. Uh, we've walked the journey um, and we are ready uh, to walk or start your journey um, with you at any given point in time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. We are not indeed. My colleagues. I think, uh, Sam, thank you so much. I think from my side, it's just around uh, the continuous learning. You know, uh, you always learn from people every time. And I must say that I have learned quite a lot today from both Julia and Ndade Hoke. And I think they've also confirmed that for myself, I'm also in the right profession. You know, I am where I am needed, where I can be able to make a contribution. And I'm looking forward to future engagements with them and making a difference in our profession and in the organizations and the people that we serve. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very, very much uh, for availing yourselves and uh, being vulnerable to uh, our listeners. And uh, the lessons I'm sure each one of them has learned is uh, go for it. Uh, listen to others, learn every day, but there's always uh, room for growth. And so thank you very, very much. And hopefully, we will connect with you again in part two if there's a need uh, from our viewers who want to hear more. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Dr. Kule. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia and AB. Um, I just, I live here just feeling um, honored and uh, the, just the generosity of what you have shared with us. I always take notes, so my notes I have... Uh, I have about <laughs> 10, 10 pages of stuff here. And thank you for developing our profession, a, an honorable profession. I My heart always um, weeps when I hear uh, people, I, you know, particularly this time when there's sexual harassment, there's GBV, and, and, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a disciple for creating work, workspaces that excite, that inspire because we are not in a dress rehearsal. This is the real life. You go to the, to the job and you want to do your best. And I see you as leaders, what we have shared here, that you inspire the people that you lead, the teams that we are involved with. I, I'm, I'm excited and we will do our best to make sure that we uphold this profession and its ethical standard, because this is what our, our country needs. This is what our continent needs. And this is what the world needs today. People that can, can inspire and, and hand, you know, and, forward, as they say, pay it forward, give the learning to others so that they can follow your path. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very grateful for your being available today. Thank you, Dr. Kule. To our viewers, that was our Human Resources Development and Management 101 conversation show. This was our Spring Day edition. Happy Spring Day. Enjoy the spring and let's look forward to the next uh, show that happens on the first Wednesday of every month. Thank you very much. Take care and be safe. Goodbye.